Greetings and shalom. This is Adrian Scott and welcome to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. Time for another edition of Bible Break. And in this reading, I am going to go into the prophets. I'm going into the old school prophets and we're going to go back to the book of Jeremiah. Or in Hebrew, it is Yirmiyahu. And I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that would roughly translate as um, Yahweh or Yehovah has uplifted. Uh, because obviously, if you know the narrative with Jeremiah, um, a lot of nasty stuff was going on. This is Israel being dispersed and exiled from their home for disobedience. And poor Jeremiah, he got to see the worst of this. He, he tried to warn them. And they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so that kind of takes us up into the reading. I will do that first, and then we'll go back and kind of discuss it a little bit. So in the book of Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah, we'll be doing chapter 17, if you would like to follow along. And the particular version that I am reading from this time is the New Living Translation, the NLT. This was my very first gift from my wonderful wife when we first became believers. And uh, I do like to go back to it from time to time. So Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, chapter 17, starting at verse 1. The sin of Judah is inscribed with an iron chisel engraved with a diamond point on their stony hearts and on the corners of their altars. Even their children go to worship at their pagan altars and Asherah poles beneath every green tree and on every high hill. So I will hand over my holy mountain, along with all your wealth and treasures and your pagan shrines, as plunder to your enemies. For sin runs rampant in your land. The wonderful possession I have reserved for you will slip from your hands. I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land. For my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Like a partridge that hatches eggs she has not laid, so are those who get their wealth by unjust means. At midlife they will lose their riches in the end, they will become poor old fools. But we worship at your throne, eternal, high, and glorious. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who turn away from you will be disgraced. They will be buried in the dust of the earth. For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. O oh Lord, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. If you save me, I will be truly saved. My praises are for you alone. People scoff at me and say, What is this message from the Lord you talk about? Why don't your predictions come true? Lord, I have not abandoned my job as a shepherd for your people. I have not urged you to send disaster. You have heard everything I've said. 
Lord, don't terrorize me. You alone are my hope in the day of disaster. Bring shame and dismay on all who persecute me, but don't let me experience shame and dismay. Bring a day of terror on them. Yes, bring double destruction upon them. This is what the Lord said to me. Go and stand in the gates of Jerusalem, first in the gate where the king goes in and out, and then in each of the other gates. Say to all the people, Listen to this message from the Lord, you kings of Judah and all you people of Judah and everyone living in Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Listen to my warning. Stop carrying on your trade at Jerusalem's gates on the Sabbath day. Do not do your work on the Sabbath, but make it a holy day. I gave this command to your ancestors, but they did not listen or obey. They stubbornly refused to pay attention or accept my discipline. But if you obey me, says the Lord, and do not carry on your trade at the gates or work on the Sabbath day, and if you keep it holy, then kings and their officials will go in and out of these gates forever. There will always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne here in Jerusalem. Kings and their officials will always ride in and out among the people of Judah in chariots and on horses, and this city will remain forever. And from all around Jerusalem, from the towns of Judah and Benjamin, from the western foothills and the hill country and the Negev, the people will come with their burnt offerings and sacrifices. They will bring their grain offerings, frankincense, and thanksgiving offerings to the Lord's temple. But if you do not listen to me and refuse to keep the Sabbath holy, and if on the Sabbath day you bring loads of merchandise through the gates of Jerusalem, just as on other days, then I will set fire to these gates. The fire will spread to the palaces, and no one will be able to put out the roaring flames. So there is Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, chapter 17. Now, there's a few things that I really do want to hit on here. Um, I will go back and start at verse 2. Even their children go to worship at their pagan altars and Asherah poles beneath every green tree and on every high hill. Just as a point of reference, Asherah, there's, that is a reference to a name, I believe. And there's variations of that name. It can change from culture to culture. If you go from one region to another, it's ultimately the same entity, but just slightly different ways of saying the name. So Asherah ties to this term uh, Ashtoreth. Um, which also ties to the term Ishtar, which ties to the term Easter, which I believe if you actually really go back historically and look is ultimately um, the queen of heaven, also dubbed um, Stemeramus, who was the wife of Nimrod. And we read about Nimrod back in the book of Genesis. Um, but yeah, known as the queen of heaven, this was basically the bare-breasted goddess of fertility. And there are many pagan fertility rites that surround her. I will not get into those right now. They're very dark. Um, If you want to look into that, you can. I have discussed it a little bit in the past. Um, But yeah, there's lots of information out there. Anyways, that's just kind of a connection there. So this is a quite literally a a bang on by name example of some of the pagan practice that the children of Israel we're doing. And keeping in mind that um, we do get the reference because it talks about Judah here. So in a very loose historical setting, what we had is you had the entire nation of Israel. This would be all 12 tribes. But at the time of um, 
King Solomon and his son, really his son, um, there was a division between the houses and you ended up with the two houses. This is something that Ezekiel prophesies with two, two sticks being twisted back together, basically being reunited. But it's the house of Israel, which were the 10 northern tribes, and the house of Judah, which were the two southern tribes. And the 10 northern tribes had already been dispersed by this time, by their disobedience. Now there was a dispersion happening in the two southern tribes, and this is the Jerusalem area. So the two tribes in the south, Judah and, and Benjamin. That um, So this happened after the fact. So as we're reading this, and it's referencing Judah, part of that is that there were, this was this separate house, the house of Israel. They had already been dispersed. And now it's happening to Judah. Then there's a section here. And I do want to slow down a little bit on this one because it's so big. And it starts at verse five. Um, This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. Now, I don't even want to touch the uninhabited salty land other than possibly could we be talking about the Dead Sea area, which is notoriously (laughs) salty. Um, The waters is something interesting there for anyone that's been there. You'd know, but anyone that's not, I guess you can. I have not been there, but you can get into that water and just kind of lay there and you, you float on the top of it. Um. But it really, the reason for stopping and talking about that one is this idea in in verse five about cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. One thing that I've always been a little concerned about, and, and this connects back to the prophecy again a little bit, is Israel, I, I worry sometimes that are they relying too much on their air force? Are they relying too much on their materialistic um, possessions, like their weapons and arms and their defense structures and all of that stuff, which certainly are formidable. That's not taking anything away from that. But ultimately my take on it is reading the Bible That as we really roll into the end times and the big stuff starts happening, it's not the Israeli Air Force that's going to save Israel. They may play a role in it, but ultimately their salvation comes from the Lord, comes from the creator. And is this a little bit of reference of what's being said here in verse five, right? Who rely on human strength. And... I hesitate to say that because and turn their hearts away from the Lord, because I don't think there's a willful turning of hearts away from the Lord. However, the very act of of believing so much in worldly things to protect them, that indirectly it has led their hearts away from the Lord. That's me really speaking from from the heart. And it is just I ask these questions and I wonder these things. So that's kind of what I sat on there. Um, But then as we pick up in verse seven, I mean, on the flip side to really establish that point, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence, right? He's the one that's going to win the victory. He's the one that's going to fight for them, right? As he will fight for you. They're like trees planted along the riverbank with roots, that reach deep into the water. They will not be lacking. None of us will be lacking if we put our hope and our trust and our faith in the Lord. And again, I I can't say it enough. Part of how you do that, read this. An interesting section in verse nine, where it says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? I I find a connection there to where it was. They talk about how the tongue, I think it was Peter that talks about how the tongue tongue is a desperately wicked thing with it. You know, we say blessings, but we also say curses. And ultimately 
What comes out of our mouth is coming from our heart. What we feel, what we believe is how we live and how we react to stuff. It does end with an interesting line at the end of verse eight, when it says, and they never stop producing fruit. When they're this tree planted right by the water and are always nourished, they're, they're taken care of. They're, they're living in a, a bountiful state that they will never stop producing fruit. And again, I go back to my Hebrew lesson where I talked about the word for fruit, which is a combination of the head or character of the person. So my head is, is referencing my character or nature and a hand in action and a mouth speaking that fruit would be what you do and what you say that defines who you are. And they being bountiful and, and never lacking water and having all their cares taken care of never stop producing fruit. An interesting one in verse 11, where it says like a partridge that hatches eggs, she has not laid. So are those who get their wealth by unjust means. Ooh, I could throw a few names out here. <laughs> I, I, that of people that I do not necessarily have the highest opinion of, um, I'm going to refrain, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think most of you would be able to fill in a lot of those blanks anyways. Um, there are some very wealthy people that are doing some very questionable things nowadays and have even achieved that wealth by, in my opinion, immoral acts. Right. You don't you don't get to the top by playing nice in this world. That's often sad, but true. I'd rather be nice and not get to the top because I'm storing my treasure up in the kingdom of heaven. Not here. There is I'm backing up a hair here to verse 10, but there is a great line in there. But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives so if you think you're doing anything on the down low, think again, there's at least one person who knows exactly what you're up to. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. It doesn't say I give all people their due rewards or whatever rewards I feel like their due rewards is what he says according to what their actions deserve. And as I was mentioning at the very beginning of the video, um, you know, the time that this is the, the beginning of the dispersion of the two southern houses, the, the tribe of Judah or the house of Judah. And Jeremiah was there. He was warning them. He was trying to tell them and they wouldn't hear it. And it just kind of clarifies that in verse 15. When people scoff at me, Jeremiah, and say, what is this message from the Lord you talk about? Why don't your predictions come true? Well, if they could look back in hindsight, they would see that they did. <laughs> Though I do like to point out that in my opinion, and this is really is just my opinion, I don't think the primary function of a prophet was to predict the future. I believe the primary function of a prophet was to lead the people back to the Lord. Um, they had gone astray. So if you picture this sheepfold and, they, and they're all the sheep that there was a breach in the fence and they were all running out the side and going who knows where. And the prophets were sent to say, hey, get back in here. Get back in here. This is where you're safe. This is where you're in the will of the Lord. This is where you're in God's will. And then stand there as the repairers of the breach. Um, I think that's their primary function. And then they say, if you don't get back in here, this is what's going to happen. Then this whole last section is quite interesting. Um, really, it's talking about uh, observance of the Shabbat or the Sabbath. And it's talking about basically conducting business and trade at Jerusalem's gates on the Sabbath day, as it says in verse 21. And then in 22 continues, do not do your work on the Sabbath, but make it a holy day. I gave this command to your ancestors. 
verse 23, but they did not listen or obey. They stubbornly refused to pay attention or accept my discipline. So what really is the instructions for the Shabbat? I mean, uh, this is another one that just gets messed up all the time. It gets, there's, so in Orthodox circles, there's this ridiculous, unbelievable amount of regulations. That n I, I really think no person could keep them all. Ultimately, when I read the Bible, what I get on the Sabbath day is that it is a day of rest. You do no work, right? Having said that, it also has notes in there that there are some things that do still need to happen on the Sabbath. You still need to care for your animals. They still need to be fed. That's one example. And um, the Orthodox, I'm, I'm preparing to give a small example here. The Orthodox make a rule that um, you have your bed, you would roll up your bed roll that you would roll up and carry around that the, the carrying of this bed is considered work and you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. See, so they've taken the basic idea that is accurate. You don't work on the Sabbath, but then they've made about 4 million interpretations of what's considered work. Um, carrying your set of keys and leaving your home is considered work. Therefore, you can't carry your set of keys. Therefore, don't leave your home. Um, that's one thing. But carrying this bedroll. So when you see in the New Testament, the stories when Yeshua is healing people on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, and then he tells them, pick up your bedroll and go present yourself to the priests, right? For, for cleansing and, and whatever else that they need to do. The main gist there that I get is he is thumbing his nose at the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of their decrees, which he, in another part of the New Testament, says, why do you transgress the commandments of God with all your man-made traditions? I'm, I'm super loosely paraphrasing, but that's ultimately it. So what those things are, all those man-made decrees, are not the word or the will of God. I again take it as it's simply that you don't work, you rest. And I also figure you take that time of rest as an opportunity to fellowship with God. So you do studies, you, you fellowship with like-minded believers, you spend some t extra time in the word, um, you do all of those things, but you don't work. And by extension, it also says that your servants don't work. When you go to a restaurant or you go to a retail store of some kind, I'll, I'll use the restaurant as, as an example. You go in there and you have a server. That is your waiter or waitress who is serving you. So for the t period of time that you're in that restaurant, they are your servant. It's in the name, right? Well, according to the word of God, you're not, your servants are not supposed to work either. So therefore, like in our family, we don't go out on the Shabbat. We don't spend money um, because in so doing, we're acquiring the services of someone and thereby making them work on the Shabbat. We may not be working, but we're paying them to work. And so that's kind of one of the difference there's and i'm mentioning all of this about the work and everything because that's specifically what's talking about here that you're conducting your business or your trade on the sabbath don't it's a day of rest do not do your work on the sabbath again as it says in verse 22 but make it a holy day now so what does that mean i define that basically as being it should be separate from every every other day of the week so whatever you do on, on the Shabbat should be different than anything you do the other six days of the week. First and foremost, your work. So you work the other six days and then rest on the seventh. Part of what um, we do with our family here is we'll actually light a candle, a particular type of candle. But we only light that candle on Shabbat. We don't say the blessing of command this commanded us to light this candle because that's not in Scripture. But we do light the candle because it is something that is we that we don't do every other day of the week. So it separates that day. 
Um, on that one day, I will blow the shofar to kind of call the family together to start our Shabbat. I don't blow the shofar every other day of the week. So that's another thing that we do to just separate that day. These are our ways to just make that day holy, to set it apart. That's the underlying point. However you want to define to do it, however any individual person defines to do it, it's just the day, the seventh day, that is to be set apart from the other six days. Right? There's different ways to do it. That's just a couple of examples of how we do it here. And then I have recently said in another video that two of the potentially biggest words in the Bible are if and they. If you do that, or sorry, if and then. If you do this, then this happens. If you don't do this, then this happens. If and then. If and then. They may be two of the most profound words throughout Scripture. And now we start at verse 24. And what does it say? But if you obey me, says the Lord, and do not carry on your trade at the gates or work on the Sabbath day, and if you keep it holy, whoa, what do we got here? Verse 25. Then, if and then. Then kings and their officials will go in and out of these gates forever, which means this city will stand. It will not be laid waste. How many times do we read about how I will lay this city waste? It will be a desert forever for the jackals and the whatever else, right? He's basically saying this city will stand forever. Whatever else, anything happens anywhere else in the world, this city will stand if you keep my Sabbath. And just to clarify that again, says there will be, there will always be be a descendant of David sitting on the throne here in Jerusalem. Just to make it very specific that we're talking about Jerusalem. Kings and their officials will always ride in and out among the people of Judah in chariots and on horses. And this city will remain forever. If there was any guess, we just took the guesswork away. Let scripture define scripture. And then that whole if and then, and I said, if not, then... Well, here we go. Verse 27. But if you do not listen to me and refuse to keep the Sabbath holy, set it apart, however you want to do that. And if on the Sabbath day you bring loads of merchandise through the gates of Jerusalem, just as on other days, so you're not setting it apart and you're working, then I will set fire to these gates. The fire will spread to the palaces and no one will be able to put out the roaring flames. The city will be destroyed. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> but on that note, I mean, it, it is a serious point. I do go back to that idea of if and then. I am going to wrap it up right there, though, and I will just say I pray blessings to you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Lord. And I would ask that if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share as always, and don't forget to subscribe if you have not already done so, and hit the notification bell. We can be found on YouTube and on Rumble and via our podcast. So whichever format may work the best for you, we're, we're attempting to do what we can to make this and this word and our message as accessible as possible. And we just thank you for participating in all of that. So with that being said, I will say have a great week and shalom and bye for now. You've been watching Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. If you have a comment, please leave it on the bottom of this video or email us at truthandtestimonyemail at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Truth and Testimony, the broadcast is not affiliated with Truth and Testimony magazine.